You're watching The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. On today's programme... Thousands of barrels of possible toxic waste are discovered off the coast of California. The solar-powered Star Trek-style ship with no captain or crew monitoring the impact of climate change on our oceans. And the electric racing series raising awareness of climate change. We speak to Nico Rosberg about Extreme E. Hello and welcome to the UK's only daily climate news show where we track the changes happening to our world right now and meet those coming up with the solutions. We aim to take you to the heart of the climate crisis, explain the data driving the changes that are already affecting us, but also show you just how far we've come. And we start today with a possible toxic waste site that's been discovered off the coast of California. Now, marine scientists mapped tens of thousands of acres of the seafloor between Santa Catalina Island and Los Angeles, where a massive dumping ground for industrial waste has long been suspected. Now, using an underwater drone, they identified more than 27,000 barrels of what's thought could be pesticide and 100,000 debris objects on the seafloor. Ivor Bennett reports. There are more than 27,000 of these barrels on the seabed near California, each one thought to contain the banned pesticide DDT. They were found 12 miles off Los Angeles, in an area long suspected of being a massive toxic waste site. Just how big wasn't known until now. Shipping logs have previously shown how industrial companies used it as a dumping ground until the early 70s, when DDT was banned. But high levels of the pesticide are still being found in marine mammals here, and the chemicals also been linked to cancer in sea lions. That prompted a huge survey by researchers at the University of California who used sonar and an underwater drone to map 36,000 acres of the seabed, and they were shocked by what they found. It really was a surprise to everybody who's worked with the data and who sailed at sea, humbly really, to run the survey and realize kind of what, what we were beginning to observe on the seafloor. You know, it was, it was staggering really to see kind of the, the spatial extent. The scientists found more than 100,000 objects in total at a depth of 900 metres. The barrels, their most concerning discovery, they're estimated to contain up to 700 tonnes of waste. Their contents will now be tested and if they haven't leaked they'll be moved to a safer location. But if they have, everything here will need to be sampled, the water, sediment and marine life, to see just how much damage has been done. Ivor Bennett, Sky News. Let's take a look now at some of the day's other climate news and scientists are warning that air pollution could have a lasting impact on children's mental health. The 25-year study found young people who are exposed to high levels of toxic air are more likely to suffer from a mental illness in later life. The researchers tested for a range of psychiatric disorders including anxiety and ADHD. A record number of drinks cans sold in the UK were recycled last year. New data from the Environment Agency has found more than 151,000 tonnes of aluminium packaging was collected and recycled. That's a 31% increase on the previous year. It's being put down to more people using their local recycling facilities. And pet owners are being encouraged to put their pooches on a more sustainable diet. London-based company Aardvark has developed environmentally friendly dog food that uses protein from insects rather than animal meat. They say it produces 80 times less methane per kilogram when compared to beef. The world's first autonomous ship is about to embark on a pioneering journey to collect critical data about our oceans. The Mayflower 400 will be a floating laboratory working out how the world can help protect marine life and stop the climate crisis. Our science correspondent Thomas Ball reports. This could be the future of ocean science, a floating lab that navigates itself around the world, powered by the sun with no humans on board. There's no need for bunks, toilets or a kitchen, leaving more room for robotic instruments that can give scientists back on land live data on the health of our seas. The ocean covers 70% of the planet, but just 5% has been explored. It's so vast that much of it is beyond the reach of scientists. Until now. 
Inside the Mayflower 400, equipment will test the seawater. Climate change is making the ocean warmer and more acidic, putting marine life under pressure. Plankton, the bottom of the food chain, will be monitored. And it will even listen to whales to gauge how many there are in the open ocean. The ocean impacts us all far more than we may even realise. You know, it's not just the food that we eat, it's, it's our travel, our trade, um, and above all, it's our climate as well. The ocean regulates our planet to a huge extent. The Mayflower should set off on its maiden voyage within the next few weeks, a 3,000-mile crossing of the Atlantic. The engineering team from IBM and Promari are already dreaming of what kit they could add perhaps even a camera that's lowered into the depths to look for new species. The ocean is under threat. If scientists don't know what we stand to lose, we can't save it. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Plymouth. Glaciers have been melting more quickly over the last 20 years than the Greenland or Antarctic ice sheets. That's according to a new study in the journal Nature. So here's how much ice has been lost from the Greenland ice sheets every year. 181 gigatons between 2000 and 2018. Now, over the same time period, 121 gigatons was lost from Antarctica every year. And here's the total loss from glaciers. 264 gigatons. Now, the report calculated that over the last 20 years, the loss of ice from glaciers has contributed to around 20% of the global rise in sea levels. So here's what that ice loss actually looks like. Now, this is the Columbia Glacier on the south coast of Alaska. And this is what it looked like in the year 2000. Now, by 2010, the ice at the foot of the mountains is almost completely melted and you can see how thin the surrounding ice is. And by 2020, it's retreated more than 20 kilometres north, making it one of the fastest changing glaciers on the planet. Well, let's bring in climate scientist Dr Ella Gilbert from the University of Reading. Dr Ella Gilbert, what part is climate change playing in this ice loss from glaciers? Well, climate change is causing glaciers to lose ice by making them melt. And that's especially true of the kind of warmer parts of the Arctic and places like Scandinavia and Iceland. But crucially, the speed at which they're shrinking has accelerated in the last 20 years just because of ongoing climate warming. And how significant is this? What does this mean for sea levels, for example? Well, ultimately, all of that ice has to go somewhere and it ends up in the ocean. And as you said earlier, 21% of the observed increase in sea level rise since 2000 has been due to the loss of ice from glaciers. And if my maths is correct, that's around 15 millimetres worth of sea level rise. And what are the risks associated with sea level rises? Sea level rise threatens people all over the world, particularly those in, in coastal communities and countries that are already close to sea level, small island developing states like Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and pretty much anyone who lives near the coast in any country. So what can we do to reverse this? What can we do to, to stop the melt? Well, the primary thing is to minimise our emissions, so reducing the amount of climate warming that goes on. Um, it's going to be quite difficult to reverse sea level rise, but we can stop any further sea level rise occurring. Dr Ella Gilbert, thank you. The Extreme E Racing Series is aiming to highlight the impact of climate change in some of the world's most endangered environments. The cars taking part use hydrogen fuel cell technology, with the race fleet charged using zero emissions energy. It's hoped that the innovations the teams come up with will help enhance electric vehicle technology for the car industry more widely. Former F1 champion Nico Rosberg has his own team taking part. I spoke to him earlier and started by asking what the racing series is all about. Extreme E is a new motorsports championship. It's based on fully electric off-road buggies. And we're really here to raise awareness for climate change, um, but also have local impact with projects that we're supporting. So it's really the first sport, sport that's built on a social purpose. And talk us through the locations that you've chosen for the various races and why they've been picked out. So we've carefully picked these spectacular locations around the world, like, for example, racing uh, near the glacier in Greenland. But unfortunately, at the same time, these locations are the ones that have been damaged most by climate change. And we're racing there because, first of all, we want to support the local initiatives and the locals in their fight against climate change, 
but also secondly, we want to raise awareness for climate change and really show people around the world what's happening around, uh, around the planet. And has your experience with Extreme E made you reflect at all on your time in Formula One? Any environmental regrets? Formula One, let's not forget, has already done a lot also for mobility. I mean, we've been pioneering lightweight materials, we've pioneered the turbocharged engines, pioneered hybrid engines, which is a great contemporary uh, powertrain solution at the moment, very efficient. Um, but at the same time, I'm also proud because F1 is doing more and more um, to also become more sustainable, uh, pledging to be carbon neutral by 2030. And this is where Extreme E is really trailblazing. We're already a carbon neutral event now, uh, powered by hydrogen energy, um, and we're doing a lot, you know, really launching these initiatives around the world to have real impact, tangible impact locally. And that's what I love about Extreme E. OK, Nico, stay with me, because in a moment we're also going to be speaking to Adam Bond from AFC Energy, who supply the power for the Extreme E cars. But first, uh, we can show you now what the racing looks like. Uh, these pictures here are from the first race, which took place in Saudi Arabia. Johan Christofferson doing the switch, and on that switch they picked up a one-minute penalty, and it really ate in what could have been a really nice lead for them. They would have been top qualifier. They were about four So, Adam Bond, welcome to you. You're involved in the technology behind the fueling of these cars, hydrogen fuel cells. So explain to us how they work and just how green are they? Sure, look, hydrogen fuel cells is, is a zero emission power generator, really. Our systems that we've uh, designed for the Extreme E uh, championship from, from, from racing in Alula all the way through to Greenland, Amazon, at every one of the locations that Nico's referenced. You know, the idea is to generate zero emission power to charge the cars, to promote and, and be fully consistent with the sustainable message of the uh, of the Extreme E uh, Championship. So uh, we are generating zero emission power. It's displacing diesel generation. And uh, it's really big. It's a first uh, first of its kind for, for international motor racing. And, and, and we believe international sporting. Well, Nico Rosberg and Adam Bond, we appreciate your time. Thanks so much for joining us today. And you can see that full interview with Nico Rosberg at youtube.com slash Sky News. And that's everything from us for today. On The Daily Climate Show tomorrow, we hear about an ambitious plan to stop flooding along Britain's longest river. That's at the same time tomorrow here on Sky News. See you then.